Hi everyone, my name is Caroline Bednarz. Welcome to weeks four and five of our distance learning. First and foremost, I do hope everybody is uh, healthy and safe at home and that you are doing well with all of these challenges. Um, I am the instructional coach over at McKinley Tech and I'm here to give you a little bit of background on your compelling question for the next weeks to come, which is what happens when worldviews change? And we're going to be looking at three general movements and ideas that contributed to the way um, to changing the way that people saw the world in Europe and then ultimately uh, all over the world. So let's start it off with a little bit of um, some definitions here. Because if we're talking about worldviews, what is a worldview? So a formal definition of a worldview would be a particular philosophy of life, so a way of thinking about life or conception of the world, so or your idea about the world. An easy way to think about this would be as if you wore a pair of glasses, and that glasses dictates your worldview, dictates how you see the world, how you understand the world, and, um, and how you understand those around you. So we're going to look first at this period of time known as the Renaissance, and how the Renaissance changed people's worldview. Um, so the Renaissance, if you're my French scholars out there, you might recognize that term. Renaissance literally means rebirth in French. And so what this term refers to is a time of cultural and intellectual revival in Europe. During this period of time, there was a big movement known as humanism. And humanism was um, a, a philosophy, a belief, that really celebrated the individuals and humans. Now what's important to understand was we know during the Middle Ages, the Catholic Church was very powerful, and sometimes people pitch humanism as the contrast or as the opposite of the, the power, the religious power of the church, and that's that's incorrect. Humanism, rather, was simply this idea that it, humanists were very much Christians and very much um, believed in their religious uh, or believed in their religion of Christianity, but they also started to bring out this idea that humans too are valuable that we should also be focused on the capabilities and celebrating what it is that humans achieve here on earth, in addition to the power of the church and the power of their faith. So humanism brought in this idea about individuals and studying human life. Similarly, during the Renaissance, we saw the rise of something known as secularism. Secularism, again, is a focus on earthly or non-religious existence. So we start to see between the two, the humanism and secularism, we start to see an emphasis on, for example, portraying human life in art and not necessarily just portraying religious art. We'll see an emergence of what is known as the humanities. So we see people starting to study um, study human world around us. So we're studying psychology, sociology, uh, literature, things that are all about human existence here on earth and not just studying the power and, um, and religious influence of the church. So be, just to be clear, this doesn't mean they're anti-religion, but simply see themselves as starting to study the world around them and appreciate the world around them as well. Now I mentioned art already. The way we really saw the Renaissance and the way we really experienced the Renaissance was largely through art, architecture, literature, and science. So this is where we start to see a focus on um, new types of um, new, new studies, as I already mentioned from there. And this is one point that's important to notice there, though, is that if it's focusing on, if this, run, this movement focused on art, architecture, literature, and science, then it, we don't necessarily touch on everyone in European society. Not everyone in European society would have had access to the money and the time to invest in these kinds of endeavors. Most people were still living on farms, most people. Uh, we're still kind of making a day-to-day -day existence. Now lastly, the Renaissance, um, were, a lot of the inspiration for this art and a lot of this inspiration for the architecture was actually because Europeans were looking back at their own history and as you, many of you studied in middle school, you studied the ancient Greeks and the Romans, the European society began looking back at their own history, their own art, their own practices, and reviving that ancient Greek and Roman art architecture and ideas in general. So that's again another way, another reason why we had this idea of a rebirth, 
And not only is um, European society changing from the Middle Ages, but they're also being reborn from their own history from the Greeks and the Romans. Um, to give you a little visual context from here for the Renaissance, you can see um, the, the spread, the areas of the, where the Greek and the Roman empires were. And then you can see Europe at this time, the same geographic regions coincided. Now, I already mentioned a lot. This is a little bit of a um, perhaps controversial concept of the Renaissance because a lot of people, what's typically taught or typically discussed is that Europe's had, European society had the Greeks and then the Roman society and then this very large, unclear period known as the Dark Ages, the Middle Ages, where it seems like European society just completely fell off and was destitute and not productive. Um, but as you've learned, and as you will continue to learn, that many of the practices continued all the way through this period of time. Moreover, many of the practices from the Renaissance actually came from Islamic society. So it was the Muslim scholars who had actually saved the writings of the Greeks and the Romans, and they shared them with their own, with the European people. So it was the Europeans who were looking to the Muslims to learn about their own history and their own understanding um, of society with the Greeks and the Romans. So this is the period, this generally speaking though, this is the timeline of what um, many historians would call the, the European trajectory here. But um, I would just call into question here is the Dark Ages an appropriate term, and it even if, is the Renaissance necessarily appropriate term. So that brings us to the second major movement that changed people's worldviews at the time, and that movement would be the Protestant Reformation. So notice the, the pronunciation of Protestant, that we even though you see those root words of Protestant or, or to protest and ref, reform within Reformation, um, just note the pronunciation be Protestant Reformation. What this was is this is a re religious movement that sought to reform the Catholic Church. So when you're trying to reform something, you can see the root words there, reform, you're trying to make it better. You're not necessarily trying to get rid of it, but you're trying to make it better. And that's important because a lot of people um, misunderstand the Protestant Reformation to mean that there was a movement to try to end the Catholic Church entirely. And when you dive into some of the sources that you'll see, the, the goal was not to get rid of the Catholic Church, but rather to protest, hence Protestant, and reform some of the practices uh, that were happening within the Catholic Church, specifically that a man named Martin Luther thought uh, observed and thought needed to be changed. Now, the consequences of this movement, the consequences of people trying to make these changes, had very significant both short and long-term effects for people in Europe and then ultimately all over the world. You yourself may even know some of these consequences or experience this because if you look at how the, Catholic, the Christian church is organized, you can see that in our early split, um, when, when uh, the church was initially formed, there was a first split between uh, Western Christianity and the Eastern Orthodox Church. The Western uh, church, as it was known, is, it became the Roman Catholic Church. That's the one we've been talking about. And Roman Catholicism continued, but you can see with the Protestant Reformation that this ultimately leads to lots and lots and lots of small groups of Christians or small branches or small denominations of, of Christianity. So perhaps you might know someone who is Lutheran. You might know someone who is Methodist or Baptist. All of those are examples of Protestant denominations of Christianity that all started with this Protestant Reformation. And the last movement that we're going to talk about is the scientific revolution that was occurring at the same time as the Renaissance and uh, the Protestant Reformation to some extent. Now, the scientific revolution was a revolution in human understanding and knowledge about the human universe, beginning largely in the 1600s, which means the 17th century. Now, if you think back to when I int initially introduced this idea of humanism, this idea that we should start to study the human world and understand the world around us in addition to our religion, this is sort of a logical conclusion, a logical next step, is that people really began to study uh, the earth in ways that are using logic and reason instead of just faith. So you could think of this like asking a question. People began to ask questions about the world around them, and rather than settling on the answer simply that, well, that's how God designed it, or so on and so forth, they perhaps start to look for logic and reason and evidence to explain some of the scientific phenomenon they see in the world. Now, you probably guessed, 
that, that has some consequences for the relationship with the Catholic Church. One example that you're going to take a look at would be looking at um, whether the sun or is in the, in the center of the universe or whether the earth is in the center of the universe. The Catholic Church had some, th some specific teachings on this, and when the scientific revolution comes around, that starts to pit the church against science, even if that wasn't the initial intent of many of the scientists themselves. So, taking a look at some of what you're going to be tackling from here. You're going to start off here with looking at a world, defining what a worldview is and the characteristics of a medieval, medieval worldview uh, using a word map and a spice chart. And then you're going to start looking um, at a, a source A to complete questions about two additional word maps. Then you're going to dive into um, some of the actual advancements of the Renaissance. And this starts to bring in this idea that it wasn't just the Europeans who were, re quote, reviving these ideas. We see that there was influence from the Muslim world and from just the classical Greek and Roman society itself. And then lastly, you can see that you got one more source coming about the Protestant Reformation, um, and you'll see how you'll end that with the creation of a positive sentence. In the final minutes, um, I'm sorry, then week five, I'm going to give you an overview here as well. When you uh, continue your study on day five of the Protestant Reformation, you're going to be looking at the consequences of uh, the Protestant Reformation and how people were seeking to change the church, the Catholic Church. When we get, then move forward in day six and seven, when you're going to start looking at the scientific revolution and how revolutionary it truly was, you're going to be looking at uh, the, the specific scientific advancements that occurred during this period of time. And we're going to come back to this idea of the spice chart. I'm going to show you an example momentarily. And then lastly, once what you've uh, collected all this information about the science, Renaissance, the Protestant Reformation, and the Scientific Revolution, you're going to get a little bit of choice here. And you're going to describe how either, either the Renaissance, the Protestant Reformation, or the Scientific Revolution changed people's worldviews in Europe between the 1400 and 1700. So going back to that initial analogy, how did those three um, movements give people new glasses to see the world, and how did that change the way they saw the world? So just as a reminder of what the SPICE chart is all about. So SPICE charts, um, as you dive into this, this stands for social, SPICE stands for social, political, interactions between human and the environment, cultural, and economic. This is, again, a way that uh, historians often analyze a particular society. They look at their social characteristics, they look at their cultural characteristics, so on and so forth. So let's look at a couple of examples from here. In medieval society, they, uh, the social characteristics was who has power over whom and what are the relationships between those people. That would be our, we had that feudal society, and once you were born into that class, there was no moving up or down. So the social systems were very structured and rigid in that particular way in medieval Europe, as an example. You'll be doing this as you look into the Renaissance world. The political characteristics in medieval Europe, they're ruled by kings and the Catholic Church. Remember that they had significant political power. So it'll be interesting to see, as you look in those sources, how that changes with these new world views. You can see that the church was the one, too, that was in charge of all the punishments and the rules of the society. When we look at our interactions with humans and the environment, we see that in medieval Europe, we had mostly agrarian societies and very few large cities. Does, this does start to change in the Renaissance with more urbanization, particularly in Italy, where they had all of the money to contribute and the trade to contribute to the growth of the Renaissance. Um, but we still have a largely agrarian society there in the Renaissance. Culturally, in the medieval Europe, we had a Catholic church, again, that was extremely powerful and influential in all components of daily life. We've probably already started to realize that this is going to start to be questioned and changed in the Renaissance, the Protestant Reformation, and in, uh, the science with the scientific revolution. And lastly, for economics, if you're looking at the, what the, the, um, the, the, how the society provides for itself and the money associated with this. Um, in medieval Europe, we had a lot of trading with the Ottoman empires and many Asian empires as a result. And we had strong trade networks over land and water. Trading cities boomed as a result. And that is exactly why the Renaissance started in Italy, where it did, because they had significant trading opportunities um, that led, of course, to money and the exchange of ideas. So there's a sample spice chart for you. Um, I hope that's helpful for you as you dive into your own. Good luck on these distance learning weeks um, and stay safe. Thanks, everyone.